it is not an industrial metal as we are led to believe. It's a strategic metal and it is needed. And the countries of the global south are understanding that. And this is why they're draining the LBMA to the second lowest level they've ever had in the history of the exchange, 140 years. This is why they're draining the COMEX. So silver will have its day and everything that we've ever talked about silver, I think will happen in spades. It'll just happen in a manner it will go from zero to 100, just like that. We'll wake up and see it repriced. You're watching Silver News Daily. Subscribe for more. Imagine waking up one morning to find that the value of silver has skyrocketed overnight, reaching levels that were once thought to be imaginable. It sounds like something out of a financial thriller, but what if I told you this scenario might be closer to reality than you think? Right now, the BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, are reportedly plotting to dethrone the U.S. dollar from its position as the world's reserve currency. And as part of this grand strategy, it could be planning to revalue silver, unleashing a surge in its price that could change the landscape for investors forever. You might be skeptical, after all, the dollar has been king for decades. But consider this. These countries have been making strategic moves for years, quietly stockpiling silver and gold, and positioning themselves for a financial shift that could shake the very foundations of the global economy. Are you prepared for what could be the most significant wealth transfer of our generation? Stay tuned as we doubt into why this isn't just speculation. It's a looming reality that every savvy investor needs to understand right now. Trust me, by the end of this video, you'll see why silver might just be the key to securing your financial future. Our plus uh, podcast, our video rather, that he narrates, he basically is reading the book to you, but it's very frightening. And, and, and the difference between physical gold held segregated, that's first and foremost. Your metals must be segregated. They should never be pooled. Um, and segregated and never be lent out because what David is talking about in essence is securities held at a central clearing authority, I think it's the DTCC and and how they can be lent out. Um, first and foremost, you know, physical precious metals is not a security. It's not held at a central clearing authority. It's held in a independent vault segregated 100% in your name. So what uh, David is talking about in this case, uh, in my mind, doesn't apply. It applies to securities that can be uh, rehypothecated or, or 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 lent out to other institutions who want to short the security or what have you. So I'm not as concerned about David Rogers Webb um, theory as it pertains to physical holding of precious metals. But I guess you could say in in theory, that those metals held in an IRA would certainly be noticed by the powers that be in an event of, of some form of calamity. And we've talked about that before. In 2009, there was a bill that made it down to the House floor that was rejected, basically said if things ever got really bad again, that they could sequester, in essence, all the funds in the IRAs. It goes to show how fast things have grown because there was $17 trillion debt then. Now it's double that. Uh, over double that. And and I guess there was roughly 17 trillion back then in IRA funds. And the theory was we take those funds, we put them into some form of an annuity, in essence, backed by U.S. Treasuries, guaranteed by the government. Um, now, that was shot down. But the point is, is that if if we try to delineate metals held in a, in a vault, it's probably a, a few degrees less uh, in terms of safety in an IRA. Um, because if you look at an IRA, you're not the owner of the of the asset. You are the beneficiary of it. The owner is actually the custodian. It's it's all um, semantics, but you can always take possession of the metal and liquidate it and say, give me my metal. But the point is, it's one layer removed of safety. If it's physically held in a vault, uh, not at an IRA, segregated in a, in a vault like a Brinks, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> which is a very large company with a big balance sheet and a great track record <clears throat> excuse me i think you have a a much better chance but here again in a systemic world that we find ourselves in the old statement of if you don't own it own it if you don't hold it you don't own it while i'm not fully on board with that statement there's a lot to be said for it the removal of counterparty risk is huge and owning physical precious metals gives you the ability to completely remove any and all counterparty risk and 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 escape that type of 
concern, which I guess you could say is valid. Desperate governments do desperate things. It would be much easier for them to go after the IRAs and metal held within than it would be to go door to door or to enact broadly a confiscation the way Roosevelt did in 33 when in 33 it was currency and now it just represents such a tiny portion of <clears throat> the assets that the American public owns. So um, it, it's valid, but I'm not worried about it in terms of segregated in your own possession, segregated accounts at a Brinks, not an IRA. <clears throat> I don't think you have anything to worry about, at least. The BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, are no longer content to play second fiddle in a world dominated by the U.S. dollar. These economic powerhouses have been quietly working behind the scenes, laying the groundwork for a monumental shift in global finance. Their goal? To challenge the dollar's dominance by creating an alternative financial system that better serves their interests and those of other emerging economies. Over the past few years, these nations have intensified their efforts to trade in their own local currencies, sidestepping the dollar whenever possible. They've also been in serious discussions about launching a new gold-backed currency, one that could offer a stable alternative to the dollar. This move is not just about diversifying away from the greenback. It's a strategic assault on the very foundation of the current financial system. By weakening the dollar's grip on global trade, the BRICS nations aim to level the playing field and increase their influence in the global economy. But this strategy isn't just about currency swaps and gold reserves. It's about reshaping the global financial order, with silver potentially playing a crucial role in this transformation. These nations are well aware that the dollar's dominance has given the United States significant leverage over global finance by reducing their reliance on the dollar and creating a system where they have more control. They're setting the stage for a financial revolution. And as they continue to accumulate silver and other precious metals, they're preparing for a future where the rules of the game could change dramatically. This is more than just an economic shift. It's a power move on the global stage. And if the BRICS nations succeed, the impact on silver and the broader commodities market could be unprecedented. Uh, I, you know, I don't, I, I mean, you could argue North Dakota is, and I'm sorry about my dog. My dog knows when it's about ready to start storming, and it is, and she's been whining at my feet for a minute or two, so I had to put her on my lap. Uh, yeah, North Dakota is one of the only states, I believe, that has their own banking charter. So in essence, they're not, I guess you could say they have some level of separation from the Federal Reserve. To me, it's more along the lines of geographic. You know, most of the vaulting systems are are on, along the eastern seaboard, Delaware, New York City. Um, and you could argue that a place like North Dakota certainly is a good place to be geographically. But what it is more relevant is segregated storage. I uh, had the... the, the the owner of Delaware Depository, uh, I went to, to lunch with him. He's a great guy. They run a beautiful facility. It's a Comex facility. I have not one bad word to say about them. But he said to me, why don't you send me more IRA business? I said, because you don't segregate IRA silver. He says, that's right, we don't. And I just have a big problem with that. Um, they segregate IRA gold. If you open up a, an account that's not an IRA, they'll segregate it for you. It's because the IRAs attract such a large percentage of, of volume for these custodians that in order to offer such a low rate, you see the custod the depositories rather, they offer a very low storage rate to the IRA companies, way lower than they would if it weren't in an IRA. And um, if you were to open up an account at any of the, the depositories outside your IRA, the rates would be three times higher. And so they offer a really low rate and therefore most of them pool it and allocate it. It's not that it's not safe anymore, it's just there's no title. To understand the significance of what the BRICS nations are attempting, we need to look back at history, specifically the downfall of the Roman Empire. In the late 3rd and early 4th centuries, the Roman Emperor Diocletian made a fateful decision to debase Roman coinage to finance excessive government spending. The result was rampant inflation, a devalued currency, and ultimately, the collapse of Rome's economic system. No one trusted Roman coins anymore, leading to their abandonment in trade and the economic disintegration of one of the most powerful empires in history.
Fast forward to today, and the U.S. finds itself in a somewhat similar position. The dollar, like Roman coinage, has been the bedrock of global trade for decades. However, the Federal Reserve's aggressive monetary policies, combined with massive government spending, have led to the gradual erosion of the dollar's value. Inflation is creeping back to levels not seen in over 40 years, and the dollar's purchasing power is steadily declining. The BRICS nations have taken notice. They see the writing on the wall, much like Rome's adversaries did centuries ago. They understand that a currency backed by nothing but trust can only hold up for so long under the weight of excessive debt and reckless monetary policies. This historical perspective is crucial because it underscores the fact that what's happening now with the dollar isn't unprecedented. It's a pattern we've seen before. As these nations push back against the dollar's dominance, they're preparing for a future where silver and other precious metals could regain their historical role as true stores of value. By accumulating silver and other assets, they're hedging against the potential collapse of the dollar, much like the smart players in ancient Rome who diversified their wealth as the empire crumbled. History doesn't repeat itself exactly, but it often rhymes, and the actions of the BRICS nations today echo the strategies that have been used throughout history to protect against the fall of dominant currencies. This isn't just about economics. It's about survival in a rapidly changing world. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the biggest fallacies is that, you know, people talking about BRICS establishing a common currency uh, and that these these countries would need, of course, and they would need a central bank and presumably be, be held in China, which is an unacceptable loss of sovereignty, especially between countries like China and, and India with territorial conflicts. And, well, you have the head of the BRICS the New Development Bank who made it clear there are no immediate plans for to create a common currency, which mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, and and even if they were willing to put aside their differences, it's hard to see what competitive advantage would ever have between a uh, uh, to the current system. And then they you know talk about a gold back yuan or all they're missing. They're miss and they always go back to the euro dollar system and that that we left the gold back system to go to the euro dollar system because it was you know it was such a, a better system and you know contrary to what people say we had gone uh, i think 180 years with no inflation and the greatest uh growth that the world has ever seen in a country by being on the gold back system but i've been reading a lot of this lately talking about this this common fallacy is that there you know there won't be a common currency and maybe there won't be and if you look at what they're proposing right now it is not a common currency they are proposing everyone having their own central bank digital currency, having their own monetary autonomy. That's number one. And if you look at the, the global GDP uh, and go 98 percent of all the gross domestic product of the world and the countries that represent that, every one of them has a CBDC in operation or development. That's number one. If you look at what's been done over the last year, all of these countries are trading in local currencies. They're trading rupee for for a uh, ruble digital they're trading uh you know uh yuan for oil um you know and that and and that yuan is convertible into gold and the shanghai gold exchange and all of these local currency tradings that are being done instead of the dollar is first and foremost project embridge uh, is a vehicle or a a platform to allow these countries to seamlessly trade back and forth with one another um, without interference of the SWIFT system, no Western intermediary banks. The dollar is not compatible with Enbridge and Saudi Arabia. Silver has long been considered a valuable commodity, but for years its role has been largely defined by industrial use. What most people don't realize is that silver is now emerging as a strategic asset in global finance, especially for nations that are looking to diversify away from the U.S. dollar. The BRICS nations are recognizing this shift. And they're not treating silver as just another industrial metal. They see it as a critical component in their plan to reshape the global economy. Unlike fiat currencies that can be printed endlessly, silver holds intrinsic value. Historically, it has been used as money and in times of economic uncertainty. It's one of the assets that people and nations turn to for stability. The BRICS nations, particularly China and India, 
have been quietly but aggressively accumulating silver over the past few years. They understand that silver is not only a hedge against the dollar's decline, but also a resource that will play a significant role in the new financial system they're working to build. Here's where silver's strategic importance comes into play, as these nations move toward trading in local currencies, and potentially a gold-backed currency. Silver provides them with an additional layer of economic security. It's not just about having reserves of gold. Silver offers a more flexible and accessible asset that can support trade and serve as a store of value. This is especially true as the demand for silver in industries like technology and renewable energy continues to rise, adding to its already strong investment appeal. Silver's versatility as both a store of wealth and a critical industrial resource makes it uniquely positioned for the financial shift the BRICS nations are orchestrating. As they prepare to undermine the dollar's dominance, their accumulation of silver isn't just about hedging bets. It's a deliberate strategy to ensure they have the physical assets to support their future financial systems. For individual investors, understanding silver's growing role in global finance is key to capitalizing on the opportunities ahead. The bottom line is this. Silver is no longer just an industrial metal. It's becoming a cornerstone of the global strategy to challenge the dollar. And those who recognize this shift early could stand to gain the most when silver's true value is fully realized on the global stage. I used to joke that this industry might be the only industry that makes less than the grocery stores, who make on average one and a half percent. Uh, they're, they're not the problem. Uh, the problem is through all the inputs that have gone up uh, in, in cost, um, fuel and seed and, and, and certainly um, fertilizer, most of which comes from Russia. And, and all of these input costs have gone up and, and blaming it on, on and then trying to impose, uh, you know, uh, capping prices. You go back to the 70s and you read about that, you'll see that farmers had price caps on chicken and the cost of raising baby chicks to the point where they could then, you know, at a, at a full grown chicken and then and slaughter it and bring it to the grocery store. It cost more to do that. So they were drowning baby chicks, killing them because the cost of, of raising them to adulthood and then bringing them to you know be processed cost more than they were allowed to sell them for. All that does is create you know, empty food shelves and distortions and people drop out of it. It's communism. It's socialism. You know, capitalism says a company that can do it more efficiently and do it better. Well, they 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 win. And if you can do something more efficient for less money, that is the whole concept of capitalism, bringing value through efficiency instead of um, imposing, you know, the government's will. And all that does is distort everything that they trust. It's a bad omen that that is a path that she is taking rather than looking within and saying, geez, spending $100,000 a second 24-7 might be the real problem, wasting our money all around the globe on initiatives we have no business being part of or wars we have no business being part of. Well, maybe that's something we should look at. Instead, blaming the people who are, are you know, running grocery stores at, at tiny, tiny margins. How about the, 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 the margins we see on Wall Street? How about the margins we see other places um, it, it's just, it's, it's, it's misdirected and it's, it's ignorant. And it's very troubling to me when you think about what could be if this administration takes power and starts implementing price controls like that, you'll end up with empty, uh, grocery stores and grocery store chains going out of business and, and vilifying these people who, you know, who are so crucial to everyone's life is just not the way to do it. Instead, look within and that probably won't happen, but that's where the root problem is. Now that we've established silver's strategic importance, let's delve into the possibility that the BRICS nations might actually revalue silver as part of their broader economic strategy. Imagine a world where silver is no longer priced based on Western market dynamics, but instead is revalued to reflect its true worth in a new global financial order. This revaluation wouldn't just be a minor adjustment. It could lead to a dramatic increase in silver's value, possibly skyrocketing to levels that few have anticipated. The idea of revaluing silver isn't far-fetched when you consider the actions of the BRICS nations. They had been systematically reducing their reliance on the U.S. dollar, accumulating precious metals, and creating alternative payment systems that bypass Western control. 
By doing so, they are positioning themselves to potentially set their own prices for these metals, independent of the traditional markets in London and New York. This would allow them to reflect the true value of silver based on demand from emerging economies, technological needs, and its growing role as a financial asset. The potential revaluation could be triggered by a number of factors. Firstly, as the BRICS nations continue to stockpile silver, they could decide to set a new price benchmark that better reflects the metal's scarcity and strategic value. Secondly, as the world increasingly moves away from the dollar, the need for assets like silver, which are seen as safe havens, will grow. This increased demand, combined with tighter supply from Western markets, could push silver prices to new highs. Moreover, the BRICS nations might decide to back their proposed new currency not just with gold, but with a basket of precious metals, including silver. This would require them to hold significant reserves of silver, further driving up demand and consequently its price. If they decide to peg their currency to a certain amount of silver, this could instantly revalue silver to a much higher level, reflecting its new role in global finance. For individual investors, this potential revaluation of silver presents a unique opportunity. Those who are holding physical silver now could see their investments appreciate significantly as the BRICS nations move forward with their plans. The key is to understand that this isn't just about the current market price of silver. It's about where silver could go if it becomes a central component in a new global financial system. The bottom line? The revaluation of silver by the BRICS nations could be one of the most significant financial events of our time. And those who are prepared and have positioned themselves correctly could stand to benefit immensely. Yeah, that, that's the point. The, the, <clears throat> the folks that think they're trying to fight inflation are, are only fighting what is the consequence of inflation and rising prices. And when you talk, when you look at, 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 at Kamala's uh, platform, she talks about giving a $6,000 tax credit for families with a new child or, or $25,000 down payment for 400,000 first generation home buyers or $10,000 tax credit for the first time home buyers. Who pays for all that? We're already $35 trillion broke on top of unfunded liabilities. Where does that money come from? So in essence, at the same time, she's, um, you know, inflating through policy by creating money to fund these initiatives and we can't afford them. Then she turns around and blames the problem on, on, on the grocery stores for price gouging when it's the government that created the inflation to begin with. And inflation is always, every single time, a monetary event. It's an inflation of the money supply, an increase in the money supply. That is what causes inflation. And when we are creating, in essence, $100,000 a second, 24 seven or a trillion dollars every hundred days, well, that's inflation. It's not the cause of, of the rise or the, the rising prices are in inflation. And we've been indoctrinated into believing the CPI, the consumer price index, the CP lie from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, take the L out of that and, and it's just be the BS um, is, is inflation. That's not rising prices are a symptom of inflation. It's the, it's the, the irresponsibility fiscal policy and brain dead monetary policy of the Fed and of the government that are creating these distortions to begin with. And it just goes to show how how uninformed the public is and certainly how un, uninformed someone like Kamala Harris is in saying this nonsense. I mean, just looking at it alone, just the cost of of um, farmers to process, package and deliver their food has gone up 31%. Uh, in, in since she's taken office as the vice president, and yet she's blaming it on groceries. The U.S. dollar has been the cornerstone of global finance for decades, but cracks are beginning to show in its foundation. The Federal Reserve's aggressive monetary policies, combined with unchecked government spending, have set the stage for a potential decline in the dollar's value. This isn't just a minor blip on the radar. It's a trend that could have far-reaching consequences for the global economy. As inflation creeps higher and the dollar's purchasing power erodes, the world is starting to look for alternatives. The BRICS nations, in particular, are leading the charge to reduce their reliance on the greenback, 
They see the dollar not as a safe haven, but as a liability, one that is increasingly risky to hold in large quantities. This shift in perception is driving these countries to accumulate physical assets like gold and silver, which they view as more reliable stores of value. The weakening of the dollar is also being exacerbated by geopolitical factors. The U.S. has used its currency as a tool for sanctions and political pressure, pushing many countries to seek out other means of conducting trade and storing wealth. The result? A slow but steady move away from the dollar in international transactions, with more countries opting to use their own currencies or alternative payment systems. This decline of the dollar doesn't just affect governments and large institutions. It has profound implications for individual investors as well. As the dollar weakens, the cost of imports will rise, leading to higher prices for goods and services. This inflationary pressure can erode the value of savings and investments that are denominated in dollars. For those who have most of their wealth tied up in dollar-based assets, this could mean significant losses in real purchasing power. But there is a silver lining, literally. As the dollar's dominance wanes, silver becomes an increasingly attractive alternative. It's a tangible asset that isn't subject to the same risks as fiat currencies. While the dollar may continue to lose value, silver has the potential to appreciate, especially if the BRICS nations move to revalue it as part of their broader economic strategy. For investors, this is a wake-up call. The era of the dollar as the unchallenged king of global finance may be coming to an end. As the BRICS nations and the world pivot away from the dollar, those who have diversified into assets like silver may find themselves not only protected from the dollar's decline, but positioned to profit from the new financial landscape that emerges. In essence, the decline of the dollar could be the catalyst that propels silver into the spotlight as a critical asset for the future. Understanding this shift in positioning accordingly could be the key to safeguarding and growing wealth in the years to come. Well, even if you read the laws that talk about metal held outside the country, the IRS is very clear on it. And they say that metal that is that is pooled is reportable, but metal that is com segregated, directly held uh, in a non-financial institution, forget that part for a moment, the non-financial institution, but they make a, a delineation between segregated and pooled. And if it's pooled, it's reportable, uh, period. And so I think it's it boils down to title. Is the title in your name? Is it your specific asset in your name? And that's important to me, it's very relevant. And and I think counterparty risk, systemic risk, is is something that will, will begin to become more prevalent when you see banks failing and, and the ramifications mm -hmm. of it. Um, specific title is very, very important. And instead of being, you know, even in the way that they define a depositor now as an unsecured general creditor, uh, you need to have direct title, direct ownership in order to feel safe about assets that are not in your own possession. And, and I think that's the moral of the story. As the BRICS nations continue to challenge the U.S. dollar's dominance, they are working on a bold new initiative that could reshape the global financial system, a new gold-backed currency. This proposal, while still in its early stages, has the potential to disrupt the current monetary order by offering a stable alternative to the dollar, one that's less susceptible to the political and economic volatility that has plagued fiat currencies. The idea behind a gold-backed currency is to create a monetary system that is anchored in tangible value. Unlike the dollar, which is backed only by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government, a gold-backed currency would have intrinsic value due to the precious metal reserves that support it. This makes it far more appealing to countries that are wary of the dollar's instability and its vulnerability to inflation. But the BRICS nations aren't stopping at gold alone. There's speculation that they might also include silver and other precious metals in their new currencies reserves, further diversifying and strengthening its backing. This would not only make the currency more robust, but would also elevate the importance of silver in the global financial system. The potential impact of this new currency on the dollar cannot be overstated. If the BRICS nations succeed in launching a widely accepted gold-backed currency, it could significantly weaken the dollar's position as the world's reserve currency. 
Countries that currently hold large reserves of dollars might begin to diversify into this new currency, reducing their dependence on the dollar and thereby lowering its global demand. This shift could trigger a domino effect. As more nations and investors start to favor the BRICS currency, the dollar could see a sharp decline in its value. In response, those holding dollar-denominated assets may rush to convert them into more stable assets like gold and silver, further driving up the prices of these metals. For silver, this could be a game-changer. As part of the reserves for a new global currency, silver's demand would soar, pushing its price to new heights. The BRICS currency proposal not only presents a challenge to the dollar, but also an unprecedented opportunity for silver to regain its historical role as a cornerstone of wealth. Investors who understand this shift and position themselves accordingly stand to benefit immensely. The introduction of a BRICS-backed currency could be one of the most significant financial events of our time, and those who are prepared will be at the forefront of this new economic era. In summary, the BRICS currency proposal is more than just a theoretical concept. It's a strategic move that could redefine global finance. And with silver potentially playing a key role in this new currency, its value could see a substantial increase, making it a critical asset for the future. Specifically to those items with your name on it. And I said, if you did that, I would send more business your way. But I have a personal aversion to that. And I have stories that I could tell about things that have happened with unallocated accounts. So... Uh, or or allocated unsegregated, not segregated accounts, pooled accounts. And so bottom line is simply this, that um, it's very important, I think, if you're going to hold metal in a IRA, that it be completely and totally segregated. Uh, if you're going to hold it in any depository, it's completely and totally segregated. And yes, it may cost more money to do so, but I believe it's 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 well worth spending the money. I'll give you another example, the Perth Mint Certificate, um, completely and totally legit entity, but they offer two forms of certificates. One is free storage. It's 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 not segregated. The other is segregated and it's a 1%, I think, which is hefty cost. So most people choose the pooled, allocated. Now, it doesn't mean it's not safe, but there is something to be said for having title in your name of a specific a specific product, specific coins, specific bars. To me, I would never touch anything that is not specifically segregated to you. And I think that's in a world of systemic risk, in a world of, of um, uh, you know, over leverage, under capitalization. It's really important that title is clear and and specific title is clear. Who owns it? And and so I that's a, a non-starter for me. Uh, I would never, ever store my own funds in anything that is not completely and totally segregated. The moves by the BRICS nations to challenge the U.S. dollar and potentially revalue silver carry profound implications for investors around the world. As we've discussed, the global financial landscape is shifting. And with these changes come both risks and opportunities. For those who are paying attention, this could be a once-in-a-lifetime chance to secure and even grow their wealth. The most immediate implication is the need to reassess the safety of dollar-denominated assets. With the dollar's value at risk due to inflation, reckless monetary policies, and the BRICS nation's strategic initiatives, holding large amounts of wealth in dollars could become increasingly precarious. Inflation eats away at the purchasing power of these assets, while the dollar's potential decline in global standing could further erode their value. This is where physical assets like silver come into play. Silver offers a tangible hedge against the risks associated with fiat currencies. Unlike stocks or bonds, which can be impacted by market volatility and economic downturns, silver holds intrinsic value that is recognized worldwide. As the BRICS nations accumulate silver, viewing it as a critical component of their financial strategy, it's clear that they expect its value to rise significantly. For individual investors, this means now might be the ideal time to start or increase holdings in physical silver. The key advantage of silver is its dual role as both an industrial metal and a store of value. 
This duality ensures that it has demand in multiple sectors, making it a more stable investment compared to other commodities that might be tied to a single market. Moreover, silver's price is still relatively low compared to gold, offering a more accessible entry point for investors. As the demand for silver increases, driven by both industrial needs and a strategic stockpiling by nations like those in BRICS, its price is likely to rise. This presents a significant opportunity for those who invest now, before the market fully reacts to these shifts. In addition to the potential for price appreciation, silver also offers protection against currency devaluation. As the dollar weakens, the value of silver in dollar terms could increase, preserving and even enhancing the purchasing power of those who hold it. For long-term investors, silver should be seen as a core component of a diversified portfolio. It provides a hedge against economic instability and currency risk, while offering the potential for substantial gains as global financial dynamics evolve. The moves by the BRICS nations to reduce their reliance on the dollar and increase their silver reserves should serve as a strong signal that this is a metal with a promising future. In conclusion, as the BRICS nations continue their strategic moves, the implications for silver are clear. It's an asset that is likely to become increasingly valuable in the coming years. Investors who recognize this trend and act on it could not only protect their wealth, but potentially see it grow significantly as silver's role in the global financial system expands. We'll go from zero to 100 just like that. We'll wake up and see it repriced or, or, or to a whole different level when, when there just isn't the ability to, to, to accumulate it on the exchanges which are being bled dry. And at some point, all of the people who have silver that would otherwise sell it, they're not gonna sell it at the Western price. It will be sold at a price far higher and probably a price that is then revalued or controlled by countries like China, who as it is right now have, are selling it for $4 an ounce higher in Shanghai. What if it was $40? or 400. It's the same thing as us talking about revaluing gold, where where uh, Senator Loomis for Wyoming can say, yeah, I like Trump's idea of the strategic Bitcoin account. We should do that and fund it partially by revaluing our gold that's held in the by the Fed. Well, there you go. I mean, it's one thing for the Dutch national banker, to, the head of the Dutch national bank to say, yeah, we're going to revalue gold because it's in the gold revaluation account and it should go much higher to offset our liabilities. But when you see Senator Loomis from Wyoming saying, yeah, we should do this to, to, to fund a strategic Bitcoin account, what's the difference if, if the West revalues it or China revalues it? In essence, a $4 premium to the Western price already is the beginning of a revaluation. So I would say silver is, is still the most undervalued, probably best potential asset on the, on the planet, regardless of how maddening it has been for the past few years in terms of its counterintuitive price movement, and and its volatility uh if there weren't and i'll keep going back to the chart ed steer put on your show mm -hmm. it's incredible people understand that there are eight banks that are holding the largest concentrated position of any commodity ever traded on comex in silver why why and it's because those eight banks are being instructed by the people above in the west to keep it down for a reason and maybe it is to fund the military industrial complex who knows point of it is that all manipulations end badly especially when you see massive efforts by countries like China and India to, to accumulate everything that's not nailed down and even do so in a clandestine manner by buying Dory and concentrate from the miners that doesn't come off of an exchange that isn't reflected the in the price so that they can have the a strategic advantage that no US one dollar. sees coming. But to truly understand the gravity of these shifts, we need to consider the insights of industry experts like Andy Sheckman. While we won't quote him directly, it's important to understand how his observations align with and reinforce the narrative we've been building. Sheckman has been vocal about the ongoing accumulation of silver by major global players, particularly China and India. These nations are not simply buying silver as a hedge. They are accumulating it as part of a broader strategy to gain financial independence from the West. This aligns perfectly with the BRICS nation's efforts to undermine the dollar's dominance and establish a more balanced global financial system. One of the key points Shepman highlights is the draining of Western silver reserves. As BRICS nations and others quietly buy up silver, the supply available in Western markets is diminishing. 
This is not just a temporary trend. It's a deliberate, long-term strategy by these nations to secure their own financial future while weakening the economic power that the West, particularly the United States, holds through its currency. What's crucial to understand here is that this accumulation isn't just about securing physical assets. It's about controlling the future pricing power of these metals. As the BRICS nations continue to build their reserves, they are positioning themselves to potentially set the prices for silver and gold, independent of the traditional markets in London and New York. This could lead to a significant revaluation of silver, reflecting its true worth as a strategic asset rather than just an industrial commodity. Sheckman also points out that silver's current price doesn't reflect its potential because of these behind-the-scenes moves. The true value of silver, when considered in the context of its strategic importance and the geopolitical shifts we're witnessing, is likely much higher than what the market currently shows. As the BRICS nations move closer to launching their new currency and possibly revaluing silver, those who have already invested in this metal could see enormous returns. For investors, Sheckman's insights serve as a critical validation of the strategies we've discussed. The growing scarcity of silver in Western markets, coupled with its strategic stockpiling by the BRICS nations, makes it clear that silver is not just a safe investment. It's a potentially explosive one. Those who understand this and act accordingly are positioning themselves to benefit from one of the most significant financial shifts in modern history. In essence, Sheckman's analysis provides a deeper understanding of why silver's success is not just possible, but likely. The convergence of geopolitical strategy, market dynamics, and silver's inherent value creates a perfect storm that could propel this metal to new heights. For those who are prepared, this could be a transformative opportunity. It just became a full participant in Embridge. And what they are attempting to do, at least that's what Delma Rousseff said, the head of the BRICS New Development Bank, former president of Brazil, is that we have agreed in principle to a common settlement currency. It is not a common BRICS currency. This is where people are going astray. They don't have to have a common currency in order for this to work, but a common settlement currency that is pegged 40% to gold and 60% to BRICS plus currencies eliminates the need for a common currency. Each country will have their own system, their own CBDC, their own monetary uh, uh, system, their own little um, economy that they have to manage and do so in a, in, a, in a prudent way. They will not be reliant upon having to go back and forth in and out of dollars to transact with other countries. Uh, and 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 stand to the to the KYC and AML problems, the anti-money laundering, and know your client and the cost and the inefficiency and the time when they can have a common settlement currency, which is addressed by having the gold held within this ecosystem. These unit tokens that they mint are held within the borders of the countries that possess it. They don't even have to send it to a central authority and have it independently and continuously audited. So when we talk about these fallacies that keep popping up that that underestimate um, the relevance of what is happening, this group that is forming, I think they are <clears throat> grossly underestimating the um, the intelligence and the sophistication of these countries who understand exactly the pushback. And instead of making a common currency with a common central bank, everyone holds their own autonomy. But when it comes time to settling, if I've got too many rupee or I have too many ruble, I just want some, I want the common settlement token. Well, that's gold and that's gold's role. And that's why the BIS reclassified it tier one. And that's why all the countries have been bringing it home because it will be part of a new system. This is really important for people to understand. Uh, and I think it's it's a trend that's growing. It's, it's, ex, it, it's literally accelerating and you can see it in, in the price of gold. Well, one other thing I'd like to mention, a lot of people say, well, okay, fine. If all of these countries are accumulating gold, what does it mean for silver? And there are some very important things to understand about silver. Uh, number one, first and foremost, China is the number two largest producer of silver in the world. And they, for many years, have been a net exporter because they mine all of these other metals. And as we've explored throughout this discussion, the BRICS nations are positioning themselves to challenge the U.S. dollar's dominance 
and in doing so, they are setting the stage for a potential revaluation of silver that could reshape global financial markets. But what does this mean in concrete terms? Let's bring all the pieces together. The BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, are not just talking about change. They are actively preparing for it. By reducing their reliance on the dollar, accumulating vast reserves of silver and gold, and proposing a new gold-backed currency, they are laying the groundwork for a new financial order. This new order could significantly weaken the dollar's global standing, pushing investors and nations alike to seek alternative stores of value. Silver, traditionally overshadowed by gold, is emerging as a key asset in this transition. The strategic stockpiling of silver by nations like China and India is not a random act. It's a calculated move to secure their economic futures in a world where the dollar is no longer king. As they continue to drain Western silver reserves and potentially set new benchmarks for silver pricing, the value of silver is likely to soar. For investors, this presents a unique and urgent opportunity. The actions of the BRICS nations, combined with the weakening of the dollar, suggest that silver could soon be revalued to reflect its true strategic importance. Those who recognize this shift now and invest in physical silver could see extraordinary returns as the global financial system evolves. But this isn't just about profit. It's about protection. In a world where fiat currencies are increasingly unstable, holding physical silver offers a hedge against inflation, currency devaluation, and economic uncertainty. As the BRICS nations move forward with their plans, the value of silver could become more evident, offering a secure and potentially lucrative investment for those who are prepared. In conclusion, the potential revaluation of silver, driven by the strategic moves of the BRICS nations, it's not just a possibility, it's a looming reality. The convergence of these factors creates a perfect storm that could propel silver prices to unprecedented levels. For those who understand the dynamics at play and take action now, the coming years could bring significant financial rewards. Remember, while this discussion has highlighted the potential for silver to surge in value, it's important to approach investments with caution and do your own research. This is not financial advice, but rather a detailed exploration of the factors that could shape the future of silver in global finance. If you found this analysis helpful, be sure to subscribe to stay updated on these critical developments as they unfold. If you remember, silver is largely a byproduct metal, where in, the, in North America, or I guess in, in all of the mining companies out there, only account for about 25-30% of the silver that comes to market most of it comes as a byproduct of mining other metals. So China and their smelters had tons of silver for years, they would export it. Uh, as of uh, this year, they have now become uh, shifted from net, net exporter to next net importer. And it's been driven by increased imports and also by, um, you know, rebalancing their domestic market and not sending out all of this this silver that they've been accumulating as a byproduct of other endeavors. And and this first and foremost is really, really big. So the number two producer of silver in the world is now a net importer instead of a net exporter. And and then all of the the, the talk, I've I've done two interviews recently with mining executives and both of them have said the same thing, that they are going around the world, China is, and in particular in Latin America, paying double what the West will pay for unrefined dore and silver concentrate bringing it home and refining it there and doing so so that it doesn't come off of an exchange and affect the price. <laughs> and so you have a massive drive by China and India. We know we've documented all of their accumulation of silver to accumulate silver too. And China is going to great lengths to hide it in terms of how much they're producing and how much they're going around accumulating in unrefined forms because it doesn't reflect in the price. Silver will have its day, and I think China is a perfect example of it. They do things thinking in terms of years and decades. We think in terms of minutes. But when you know one of the biggest exporters in the world goes to net import, and they're already the number two largest producer in the world, it should tell you where silver ultimately will go. It's not tier one 
but it's it's strategic. It is not an industrial metal as we are led to believe. It's a strategic metal and it is needed. And the countries of the global south are understanding that. And this is why they're draining the, the LBMA to the second lowest level they've ever had in the history of the exchange, 140 years. This is why they're draining the COMEX. This is why the others stand for delivery. We've talked about this for years and they have been doing it very methodically and very um, very opaque in their manner, not transparent. And I think it's accelerating. So silver will have its day and everything that we've ever talked about silver, I think will happen in spades. It'll just happen in a manner it will.